Okay. Um, well, I'll just introduce myself. I'm John Breed. I'm an entrepreneur resident and uh, a lecturer in the Jim Ryan School of Entrepreneurship. Um, that's just one set of tasks I do on a daily basis. Uh, another set is I also work for a very large um, privately held tech firm, and I'm over and help kind of guide what would be called IT services or solutions. And the way to think about that is where a client really is trying to implement technology. So uh, my job would be to help them come in and take a business need or an issue that they're having, and we're gonna architect down a, a solution which may have any numbers of things, from software, hardware, to, to really business process change or workflow change. We're gonna architect that, and then um, I'll help bring in the teams that can actually implement it, and then even bring in teams on the back half of kind of benchmarking whether or not we got the change we want. Um, so I do both of those jobs really today. My kind of role in that is um, at the moment it's mostly public sector focused. Most of my clients outside of the classroom are, are public sector agencies. Um, I didn't grow up in public sector, so I'm going to make one quick pitch before we kind of roll into this. This is you're going to find that I'm going to go broadly and kind of quickly, and more than happy to stop and come and talk about anything that interests you. Um, but it's, the interesting part about this is when I talk entrepreneurship, I'm going to define what I mean by that, and then I'm going to talk about the larger trends of, that I see in technology, which are going to be a little less leading edge um, in terms of the furthest things out there. It's more of like my view of technology is like, what do we take in the market? What's actually impacting like people and organizations like in, in the more near term? And then what's the commercialization of some of those pieces? And hopefully try to give you some strategy around it. So if I'm interested in startups and entrepreneurships, um, I should define that also. So besides doing those two jobs, I've, I've uh, successfully exited out of two companies I've started. Um, I've bombed in a third. So I kind of have this great range of totally losing an investment and care and weight and stress in one that didn't work. And on the other end of the spectrum, um, I had one that we ran for 10 plus years and sold to a publicly traded firm in Silicon Valley, an e-commerce company. So I've got kind of this, and I have one that kind of landed in the middle that I consider a pretty huge success. We exited out and sold it to uh, a client, and um, it didn't have the same impact, but to me it was really interesting. It was actually just purely an e-commerce play. Um, prior to that, I was a management consultant at IBM. Uh, mostly working on really large technologies around for-profit companies, not public sector like I do now, and more non-profit stuff. Uh, so that's the background um, that, that I bring uh, to the table. I teach a class here on campus um, that we've created, and we're still trying to learn how to present, really, around emerging entrepreneurial technologies. So we spend a whole semester, like literally week by week, breaking down a different technology, we have still have the time here to do that, so I thought we would just kind of go through it. But I feel like I get the bully pulpit for a second, and meaning I get to kind of dictate what we're going to talk about. And I just think I'm so happy to be back on campus. I haven't been on campus in a year. Um, I was off doing projects and teaching online to be back in a lecture setup. The coolest thing about this, and maybe the thing that you underappreciate, is being back in an environment where everyone's actually trying to get better, or most everyone, I should say, let's make a broad sweeping statement. This group, and most of the people you probably interact with, totally trying to get better, right? That's not the way the rest of the world always works. It would be really, really cool if they did. Um, so for me, being back and, and, and interacting with you all is awesome, because oftentimes I end up in cubicles or on conference calls talking about inane stuff, right? And that's the kind of stuff that you'll end up one day, but never lose appreciation for this environment and this opportunity you have in front of you. Um, I usually make a really quick, just to show you how freaking valuable FSU is to you, it can be. Um, I think oftentimes when we talk startups, we want to gravitate towards Silicon Valley. We want to gravitate to these incredible success stories in the one time magazine. I like to say if you took my online class, entrepreneurship is incredibly sexy. We love to talk about it in this big way. It doesn't a, I don't think it's very sexy. Um, success is sexy. That's different. 
But in terms of the grind of doing these kind of things, you have to have some innate drive to want to do them. You follow what I'm saying? So oftentimes I think people who don't understand that, you guys are either understand it or about to understand it in Startup Week and hopefully other endeavors is, it, it's not about that. The intrinsic value is like trying to create value in some way, a return on investment. And we'll talk a little bit about business models before we jump into tech too. But what's really interesting, if you think about any major kind of conversation with someone about entrepreneurship who doesn't do it, they immediately think like Silicon Valley, Facebook, Amazon, you know, they go down that road. Or you have to be in an Ivy League. Um, who knows the CEO of, of Apple? Tim Cook, right? Tim Cook, right. Um, so basically took over for a visionary C, uh, CEO, um, walked in and took Steve Jobs' position when he had cancer and then eventually died. Um, has You could argue over a lot of things of whether you like every product that he's produced. Um, the first real product that he managed uh, was, the, was the watch, not the phone. Um, to varying degrees of success, except that this totally disrupted all watchmakers in the whole world. Talk to Rolex, I have one. And if you were on that management team, you're scared to death. Because I can tell you the sales are dropping. Right? Just watch the used market. Total disruption, his first product. But so you know, it's Sim Cook. Do you know where he went to school? I do not. Does anyone know where he went to school? Does anyone want to take a guess? You're not allowed. <laughs> <laughs> take a guess. I mean, think about it. He's in, He's running Apple. It's one of the four biggest tech firms in the world. It's close to a trillion dollar. We want to, it's on the verge that you could argue over which company is going to have the first trillion dollar valuation. Apple's in that conversation. No one's going to take a guess. Just shoot something out. MIT. MIT, yeah. MIT would be one that you would think. Anyone else? I play shoot. Well, here's what's really interesting about the book. And this just goes to show that you don't have to go to MIT, you don't have to go to Harvard, you don't have to go to Stanford. No one really gives a damn when you're building your business, right? Those are all really cool. He went to Auburn. He grew up in a really small town in South Alabama. He's like the first openly gay CEO of a major technology company. This guy's a freaking trailblazer, right? He didn't grow up in the, grow up in the cradle of Silicon Valley. He grew up in a tiny town south of Mobile, Alabama. Right? If he can do it there, you're saying you can't do it here? <laughs> right? We don't have to go to MIT to do this stuff. So I think if you bear with me on that, I love being back on campus. This is awesome. It, it gives me a lot of joy. I'll stop at the Hallmark moment. Let's move on. Can I throw one more in there? Sure. One of the, the co founders of Intel is from Iowa. Yeah, I mean, poor, poor co founder. Very, uh, if, if you take, Adam takes uh, a couple of my classes actually. So. Um, my other favorite thing is besides thinking about how startups happen, how technology gets applied, and how we use it to build companies. I love backstories on companies. It's kind of like if you're a sports guy, the 30 for 30 thing. I like the 30 for 30 thing in sports, but I love the 30 for 30 thing behind the, the CEO or the designer or the company that gets started. The backstory is always really interesting. So first and foremost, since we're talking entrepreneurship, we're talking technology, what you gotta believe right off the bat is tomorrow's greater than the day. Period. I don't care if you read the news, I don't care what people are telling you, it's absolutely greater tomorrow than it is today. And it's been that way for a really long time. And a lot of that's driven off of technology and the fact that we're adopting technology at a faster rate. So if you don't believe me, I'll just back some facts up real quick. So the implications of, and the fact Tomorrow's always been better than today, really in the last hundred or so years. This is hundred years across the globe. Global income's up 300%, lifespan up 250%. Cost of food, way down. Cost of energy, way, way down, right? One <coughs> more facts for you. Literacy rates across the globe is 88%. It's 12% a hundred years ago. You go to your parents and they would still meet people that I have friends that didn't know where to live in our country, in the developed world. But we're now down across the globe at 88%. Amazing. Transportation, just Uber alone is just a remarkable thought process, right? Communications, I mean, texting's free at this point, right? I mean, even on the Wi Fi, you don't have to have, as you all know, you know we can work around this thing. And knowledge, 
my gosh, you know, the, uh, the person that put this little slide together um, is one of the founders of a place called Singularity University, which is like a technology university for people that can have huge impact. Like, um, I think the, to get into Singular University, Singularity University, you have to be able to prove that whatever you do could impact more than 100 million people. So oftentimes it's big media people or big stars, somebody's got a platform, right? Or someone has capital. Um, but the founders of that, they were basically walking through, like we get really caught up in the fact that things look chaotic. But it's like we actually live in a land of abundance. Like the world is pretty abundant. And we think about things being very finite. Wealth is not finite. There's no such thing, right? It's not that if I take a dollar and I don't know how to dollar because I hate people. But if I had a dollar and hid it under my, you know, under my bed, I'm not really, a dollar didn't, you know, dollar doesn't hide, it doesn't hide like that. We build wealth. Startups build wealth. Entrepreneurship drives economic wealth across the globe. It lowers lifespans. It makes our lifestyle so much better. So the stuff that you're trying to work on right now is awesome for you, but it's freaking awesome for the whole world. It may not always look that way, but that's what's going on, right? So if you'll bear with me, I'm preaching. I can't. All right, what the hell is a startup? There's a ton of definitions. I love Eric Reese's, uh, or how do you say his last name? Um, he basically did the lean startup, he got rid of the book, um, which is a, a fantastic model for doing a startup. Um, I don't think lean startup is the only way to do it. I particularly think if you're leaning technology, lean startup is probably one of the best. Um, but there are different ways to get there. But his point is pretty straightforward. Um, the the one word in here that I love the most, what do you think it is? New? Yeah, I love new. Like, that, that would be a trick. But no, um, actually it's uncertainty. Like, think about the world that we live in. It's great. It's abundant. It's also chaotic. right? Um, so we constantly live in a world of uncertainty. You don't believe me, and let's take somebody that's, um, if we took the CEO of, of Ridge Carlton, go back eight years, let's say, <coughs> ah, I'm not, I'm not calling my mouth really long, because that could be recession time. Let's pick a good year in history for them. <laughs> they could be sitting like in a boardroom with a bunch of other people celebrating, woohoo, quarter results, we killed it for Ritz Carlton, we set the stage for luxury. Who are our competitors? Four Seasons. You know, we could name off of any any level of luxury brands. You know what they weren't thinking about? They weren't thinking that you were a competitor in Airbnb. They weren't. They didn't realize they were in a world of uncertainty. Right? The taxi cab driver in New York did not realize he's in a world of uncertainty. The cashier in most businesses today, retail, has no idea that they're really in a world of uncertainty. That's going to blow up that career. We'll probably end up creating more careers, but that's going to be blown up. Right? Anybody that you watch pushes paper, go to any organization. I do this all the time as a consultant. And if they walk around and take one set of files to another and drop it off with no real intelligence behind it, I would suggest to you that their job's going to be disrupted sooner rather than later. Right? That's the uncertainty. So we, we're in this extreme set of conditions, but we're creating new products. That's really what we talk about when we talk about entrepreneurship. Right? So disruption is exactly that. Um, I think there's a really easy way to figure out when things are about to be disrupted, which is not everyone agrees. I'm going to pick on you. How would you know that a business is about to be disrupted, or a market, or anything? Um, new technology. New technology, maybe. Yeah. Anyone else? Being true. I'm sorry. Or yes, um, either one. Start you and you go. Well, basically, they don't like contribute anything to the table. Yeah, you guys are nailed. Uh, there's no innovation or changes that they're making or anything they're doing to yeah. reevaluate or venture out Perfect. of their niche. Yeah, so we've got new technology that we can apply, <coughs> right? Um, no innovation. What did you say? I'm old. Sorry. <laughs> Basically, the, so, no so we're the same thing, like, right? Yeah, yeah. Not pretty similar. The table. So if we had a whiteboard here, uh, and I'm not going to draw because I'm a terrible drawer at the moment. Essentially, the way to figure out if something's about to disrupt is if the price to you, whether it be monetary or friction in terms of how hard it is to do something, if that price continues to rise and there's no underlying innovation, you got a problem. Cable industry, like TV cable, perfectly right for Netflix to have walked in and kind of destroyed them 
or more importantly, DirecTV doing Sling and doing kind of streaming skinny bundles that we can kind of a la carte out TV, right? Because cable bills kept going up, they got really expensive, and there wasn't any more underlying value they had been creating at that time. They're getting better now, but it wasn't like you could take your cable anywhere. You couldn't stream it anywhere. You go back a few years ago, it's like I'm just freaking paying for cable, and I'm only in my house for like, what, two hours a day watching video, but I'm paying several hundred dollars. Right for disruption. disruption. So when you think about it as a startup, you want to think about things like that. Things that either have friction, where there's chaos, where there's problems, that's where entrepreneurs should gravitate towards. And if you want to try to figure out how do I time those things, this is an inexact science, but you start looking for where there's no, no underlying increase in value or innovation, and the cost, be it monetary or otherwise, continues to increase. Those are markets that are right for disruption. Right? Use technology. One thing I'll say about technology, and, and I live in a technology, it's how I've always made my money. Uh, but technology is a tool, it's not an end goal. Right? It, it, you can simplify it down, it might as well be a hammer. You see now. So we, we have to learn a lot of different technologies, group them together, and then apply them to, frankly, a business model. Most times. Even when I'm in with a public sector, like at a state agency or the Pentagon or any of those kind of clients, I still always ask the business need question first. What are you trying to do? Okay, so you're gonna to try to improve training for all your agents in the field. Great. And they'll go, we're gonna send them all tablets and start like, whoa, 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 whoa. Are you secure them? How are we pushing that content? Is that the right application? It's like, it's not the iPad that's gonna save you. It's the systems around it, right? So technology's the tool. You guys with me so far? Do you have questions? Oh, I almost feel like I should be on the podium like the Baptist preacher or something. Like that. <laughs> um, so I just think it's really important before you dive into technology and we get deeper in that to understand entrepreneurship is really important. It's driving really, it's a positive force in the world <clears throat> that you're in a position right now that it's unlike most people in the world that you're, you're in an an environment that incubates this, that seeds it, that helps support it. The things that we're doing here, the fact that you guys are here on a sunny Friday afternoon just trying to learn more about it, it's pretty impressive, but leverage that stuff. This is important work. And recognize that we're always dealing with uncertainty, and we don't really know the environment and what's about to happen. Someone may invent something around the corner that blows up everything we do, including my job. So I gotta learn how to adapt to disruption and see when something's about to be disrupted. Yes, I came point. in late, so maybe you've talked about it, but sometimes the technology is the driver. I mean, it can be, absolutely. He's teaching kids this this semester or starting in the summer yep. how to do genetic engineering, correct bacteria, or genetic, genetic engineering. Uh, cancer has been a problem for a long time, still is, but we're making advances in Huge immunotherapy. So absolutely. that opens up a lot of yeah, um, so I, I just wanted to put that in. Sometimes technology driver, sometimes it's other social oh, no doubt about it. changes. It, 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 when you, when we're, we're solving a problem, yeah. let's suggest. Yeah. And we could call cancer, if you break into my terms, a business problem as well, right? right? That, or that would be friction chaos problems, right? Yeah. The technology can help us drive to get to the next level of solving that issue. There's still business processes around, sure. right? There's still yeah. things that have to happen, workflow. But I agree with you. Um, to that end, like think in terms of um, what's the Chinese uh, chat? Is it WeChat? It's WeChat, right? It's uh, like the number one platform. One of the things that they really beat everyone else in is not around the texting and the chatting. They started embedding like services inside of it. So in particular in WeChat, they were really the first ones to embed financial transactions. So you could pay things in the chat, right? Now it's already starting to feel old with Venmo and all the different services we put in. So that was pretty revolutionary, taking two technologies put together and saw the issue coming out of paper money, yeah, getting you a digital currency. We've talked about digital currencies before you guys were born. But we needed the technology to be able to accelerate that change. And it can drive that. I agree with you. Oh. You think we're really going to get rid of cash? I think. Yes. Jeez, um, I, I kind of hope so. I have a question. Yeah. Now you're on the topic of digital currency. Yeah. Appreciate it for me with the. Sure, yeah, we're gonna, it's one of the trends, right? Um, yeah. Do you feel like that is, like you can actually feel like with every day with the cash, how do you feel about that? Do you feel like 
that it eventually got kind of denied and scrubbed, and you know, it's just kind of yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, to, to let, me, let me reshape your question for a second, and make sure I understand. So, one one part would be, do I think we're going to go away from from paper currencies, right. and will that potentially sprout new industries or new workflows right. to some exactly. degree? Absolutely. Um, for instance, it's if I order something now, I immediately go to, do you have Apple Pay? Can I do this? Because if don't, it sounds, well, okay. you can judge my vanity and simplicity. I want to freaking pull this out. And I actually don't want to carry it because I'm ADD and I will lose it, right? I'm already down to like, I want the fewest amount of things I got to keep up with, right? And if I can do this instead of this and this, and if I can have, instead of taking four things and get it down to three things, to me that's valuable. Right? So, but with that comes all new kind of devices. And I think this is replaced by something else. You know, so I do, I think anytime we make those kind of major changes, we have a tendency to live in a legacy world. Right? Um, so we showed that in the class. I was just starting fascinating listening to someone who had come back from China, and they were talking about going into a restaurant in China, and literally just their neighborhood place, they lived there for three years. The barrier for him was not the language, he and his wife. The barrier was they walked into a new restaurant and they couldn't figure out how to order. They sat at a table, no one came. They just sat. Like, yeah. I mean, you can imagine the awkwardness of that, right? And eventually, someone that basically is a runner for a kitchen points to a QR code. Just can't and they're like, ah, QR code, boom, menu comes up here, right? Order the process there. Sent directly to the back of the house if you're in the restaurant world, to the, to the kitchen. It all gets prepared. It's brought back out to you. Never once a waiter or a waitress, right? Brought by a runner. In the end, they were like, we we're ready for our check. They, they don't even have a cash register. They had no way of. He tells the story of this uh, NYU Stern <coughs> professor. That at some point the runner took pity on them, and they just paid her cash, and then she paid for it. On her <laughs> so they've done away with waitresses and waiters, no cash register, no hostess, right? They've automated the back end and the front end. It's pretty dramatic. Changes the whole process, right? That's where we take a bunch of technologies, and then we do kind of like combine them, and then we take a huge technological leap. We have a hard time with that because we're stuck in an old way because credit cards are pretty good, right? They didn't have them. Go to Africa on mobile payments, very big in Africa. They don't get mail bills like your parents probably still get, right? Why? They didn't have a post office. They didn't have a dress, right? But they do have this. So for them, in some cases, that disruption that we talk about is someone who might have been behind you gets to use new technology and is not hampered by the old way of doing things, right? Changes a lot. Like I would argue, some of that's around cancer. I would assume regulations, testing, all kinds of like legacy systems around some of those things. Right? The answer to that question is, I think, I think it absolutely right. responds to all new things. Um, I'm amazed that the, I have three generate three kids at varying ages. One that's 27, she just finished her MBA at the University of Chicago, all the way down to one that's 16 that goes that's a junior in high school. And I think of the 26-year-old who's now living in Boston, who doesn't own a car, you know, Venmo's everything, who lives probably very similar to you all. Yeah. And she's vastly different than the 16-year-old in terms of how she interacts, right? And that's a, that's a pretty light scam, man. Wait till you guys have your aunts and uncles, and that first baby comes in the world from, from what some sibling. And watch how they deal with technology. You'll start to sound like us. Like, yeah, I want bank. <laughs> They're keeping damn dollar bill around. You know, I mean, it just changes. It changes very rapidly, right? So if you're with me on that, does anyone else have questions? Yeah. So you talked about how you would think that because of emerging technology, that it's like not so obsolete, um, yeah. but kind of like easy, like dumb jobs or whatever. Yeah. Um, are going to go away. What do you think is going to happen to the workforce in general? Are you you think that people are going to yeah, have to uh, elevate their like, education levels, or will people? Dude, that, I have very possibly? mixed emotions about that. Um, and I, I suspect if you've thought about it at all, and if you do, hopefully we spawn you to think about it. Huge mixed emotions about that. 
Because um, I'm like every other human, the first thing when you do change for me, I fear it. Like even though I'm like try to be a techie guy and try to keep up with stuff, I still fear it. And I look at it going, holy cow, I'm going to replace all the cashiers at, at Home Depot. What happens to those people, right? Or um, a, 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 a waitress or a waiter or um, in the doctor's office, the person who's doing all the appointments. I, I can't stand the way I do appointments at a doctor. It's the biggest friction. That, if there's an industry to be freaking disrupted, that's it. Just the services around medical stuff is insane, right? Uh, any one of you guys that's in the startup place to go. There's a lot of money in there, uh, by the way. Uh, so, yeah, I have huge issues with that. And my instinct is to initially to go, holy cow, we're going to lose like 40% of the population who doesn't have the skills to, to correct it. And then I go back to the fact that, that I grew up in a white trash family. Seriously. In South Florida, I mean South Georgia, who were originally sharecroppers. And my dad was the first one to get a college degree. I was still, you know, generation, several generations later, I was still only the second one of that family that's got a lot, I got a lot of aunts and uncles and cousins that didn't understand birth control and you know, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> so, to be honest with you guys, right? Like so I was only the second. Freaking I'm just giving you know, like some perspective. So my point is, and I was the first to get a, a graduate so, degree. We've evolved pretty quickly, you know. I think we solved those problems. I think I, collectively, I believe in you guys. I believe in us. At the end of the day, like the first time someone got a smartphone and had Google on it, there was some parent going, Jesus, how are they ever gonna get anything done? You know? And now what do you do on your phone? And how much does it actually help your productivity? Right? Guess what? We you guys solved that problem pretty quick. Right? In general. So I think there's a huge skills gap. I would argue that this whole thing around chasing Amazon for headquarters two for 50,000 jobs or 5,000 jobs, that those cities would be way better off taking the same amount of dollars and putting them into increasing the skills of their workforce to produce 5,000 high paid jobs in their community themselves would be a way smarter approach. But I think that we're smart. I think in the end, we just figure things out. Go back to my old stories, like if you go back and look at when we had our first railroad across across America from East Coast to West Coast, people had legitimate fears around getting on a railroad because it might go too fast. What would happen to them, their organs? There were legitimate people complaining about that. Well, that's, we now figure out that's bullshit. Right? It's about planes. So it's, and there's speed limits. It's not people like me going too fast. It's not a biological issue. So my takeaway is I just kind of have this innate theory that I continue to believe that we'll just create new jobs. There'll be some people hurt in the grand scheme, but the greater good is higher life expectancies, greater wealth, more security, better communication, <coughs> air connectivity. Uh, fascinating about that. All right. So so just technology, we're all over the drinking board. I'll, I'll, I'll just make a quick comment. I, I, I keep wondering, my own story, you, you guys are, you know, I'm, I'm originally from Florida, and, you know, so I was in Silicon Valley the last decade. Oh, that's right. And, right. and coming back, that. and coming back, I, I, I wonder myself, what does, you know, what does Southern uh, Florida, you know, Florida slash Southern innovation look like? And like, there's a picture of it. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's, that's a story you would not hear in California. Yeah, no, you're never going to hear that. I mean, Tim, Tim Cook is a picture of that. Yeah. He's the most powerful CEO, or arguably one of the most powerful CEOs in the world. Think about it in his lifetime. He's in a small South Alabama town in a gang. He went to Auburn. And now he runs like, that's amazing. So that's how we saw it, right? Like we have an innate ability to survive and thrive. And that's what we're built to do. I think startups are, that, that, like actually I think startups are in your freaking DNA. Like the people who aren't into entrepreneurship and creating things, they're just denying their own DNA. They should, we're designed to figure out how to thrive. Right? Just us in this room are trying to figure out how to actually apply it. Yeah. So there's, there's another John Breed. Uh, we'll take that with a grain of salt. <laughs> all right, so we talked about disruptors, but look at these disruptors. This is pretty fascinating to me. All common logos. We all know these logos, right? But imagine what they did. Right? So we took some technology, obviously, changed whole business models, blew things up. And, and arguably, the four most valuable companies in the world sit here. And probably the top 10, a lot of these are going to land in from Amazon, 
Apple, Facebook, Google, those are what's considered the big four these days. Who, by the way, you know, Amazon started off as a, as a bookstore, and they named themselves when Jeff Bezos named that Amazon was, people would ask him why name a bookstore Amazon. He was like, eventually we're gonna be as dense and complex and as all encompassing as the Amazon jungle. He knew he was just trying to get books in, and that was gonna be a platform to do greater. Now think about the fact that we went back five years ago and they felt very different, but they're not. I mean, think about the, I didn't put in here as one of the trends, but voice is obviously a trend. I mean, Amazon now leads in voice, they were a bookstore with Alexa, right? Apple's playing catch up with Siri, Google's in that mix, right? They're all trying to figure out the next platform. They all came from trying to solve problems in totally different ways. Google's an advertising company, an algorithmic, advertising company, no matter what they tell you. They're there to sell advertising, that's how they started. It's not where they are today, right? Apple will tell you they're a hardware company, primarily. It's not really where they are today. They're into voice just like the rest of us. Amazon was a bookstore. I mean, Facebook was connecting, they wanted to connect people. I mean, they're as big into voice and AR, VR, as anyone out there. It's really interesting to me, the way this stuff changes. So, I, and by the way, so just for kicks, um, I'm going to argue 80% of those, those companies on that list right there, which are all incredibly successful, in your lifetime, 80% will be gone. Right? The life cycle of companies, they're, they're people. They must all be people. Right? And these people, oh, um, they die too. Businesses have lifespan. Ask Sears, ask Kodak. Right? Well, that's an interesting one. Ask my former employer, who on the 20, 22nd, it's a startling number, 22nd quarter of lower revenues and lower profits, that's IBM. If you were in IBM in the 1990s when I was, I can't even imagine that. You can't imagine the wealth that was in there. They, they sent me to IBM University in the 90s and all the executives came in in helicopters. They had their own university outside of here, they still do. That's how much wealth, and they've gone 22 freaking quarters with less revenue and less profits. They, they ain't gonna make it, really, not at this pace. By the way, another lesson in your startup, if you're not growing, if your revenue flattens out or starts to decrease, you should freak out on one day of that. I mean, you can't not react to no growth. Right? And shrinking should be unheard of. And IBM's done it for 22 straight quarters. Yes, ma'am. Sorry. So if 80% are gone, which ones do you think will stay? I, you know, that's, that's, that's impossible to pick. If I could do that, <laughs> we would all invest right now. I'm <laughs> going <laughs> um, your firm. I, mean, I, just, I just think it's tough, right? And there's, there's, there's people who spend an enormous amount of time and money and, and algorithms and data to try to predict that. It's the, it's the not predictable to some degree. They get disrupted. Like, I think Netflix is amazing, but I would, in a, in a weird way, I'd hate to be fighting. Amazon's just like the one that's the most scary to me. Like, everyone used to be so scared. I was so scared of Google. Like, how, who displaces Google? Friggin' Amazon. That's it. Like, you know what's more valuable of a search? Is it just a random search on Google, I mean, for a business? Or is it a search inside Amazon where you're about to buy something? I can tell you which one's way more valuable for targeting advertising and getting your products sold. It's Amazon. You would have never said that eight years ago, right? Netflix, they gotta fight Amazon. And Amazon's got like $38 to every $1 Netflix can spend. I bet that's pretty damn close on the map. If you and I had 38% more capital, I mean, $38 for that's 300, what's, what's the map on it? A lot, right? We can just win just by raw throwing money at it and learning. We don't have to be the best. We just will eventually get to the best because we can keep paying for it, right? I think Amazon is probably the scariest. So if I were picking one, my, my horse would be on Amazon, although I think they're, they're set 10 years from now to go through an antitrust. Yeah. Um, I know a lot of us, like, we, we really like entrepreneurship and that um, we really look at ideas and like see how like we can interrupt like disrupt things and change yeah. things and I think 
like that type of passion and um, that type of thoughtfulness for the economy around us um, is very valuable to these companies. But how can we, as like students, like get to the level where we can have an input? Like we are the consumer; we're a large portion yeah. of that consumer, yeah. that consumer base. So with that, we do have a lot of ideas about like things that can change this world. But I think that because of like our age and our experience, we're not uh, given that like chance to ha play a part in this. Yeah, yeah. So how do you see? Um, you playing a part in like this innovation and getting in on this. All right, so I'm gonna give you uh, an answer that you may not love, but it's okay. You don't have to love it. Um, do you guys have a platform that we that, that, that most people have never had? I mean, take um, what's on Facebook right now, Me Too, right? We talk about sexual assault. Like the fact that that can go organically that fast and have that kind of impact and change a conversation literally happens in 48 hours. Um, I like to go back to what feels like ancient, maybe a little date me, the ice bucket challenge. Right? Like, do you remember how fast that changed? I'm not picking on you that like, you don't have, I mean, it's always hard. There's friction around changing any business, any market, any social issue. People get ingrained, right? I mean, mm -hmm. that's a legacy kind of system argument that older businesses like IBM have a hard time keeping up with Amazon because they're carrying a bunch of old legacy thoughts and systems to get there, right? Um, so my argument to you is, and I'll come, I'll come your way, is you have a lot of those tools, and I think those tools are going to get, the more connected we get, the next 1 billion that come online, 2 billion, I mean, there's, Zuckerberg's like the next billion, that's what he talks about. I mean, there's a, more than a billion people who have never even been on the internet yet in, in the world. And what do they want? How are they going to impact it? So I, I think that change is, is going to be easier although still difficult. And I think from a business perspective, like a startup perspective, I think you have to figure out a niche and do it really well. So one thing I wanted to talk about and you just helped me get there is like, what, what's a business model? What's a business model? Business model? Yeah, um, like from a startup perspective. It's uh, some kind of chain that makes some, uh, creates value. Close, all right? So I think you can simplify a business model down to basically two parts. It's value creation and value capture. I.e., if I just produce something that creates some sort of value. And that value can be wildly from solving cancer to cutting down a queue in a line, right? There's still value in that. And then if I create that, how do I capture that either monetarily, it's mostly how I think about it, capture the value around that. So I think the way you beat these kind of companies or change them is you pick off niches where you know that there's friction or problems, you create more value than they do, and as long as you can capitalize it and reinvest, then you change the game, and then probably even not buys you. you know? <laughs> Sorry. Go yeah, on. and like, I guess my follow-up would be like, I would say that we are value creators, and I, I've known that, I totally agree. but I feel like just with the platforms we're giving, a lot of times, like our value, like our contribution, it's free. So like, it's that value capture that's difficult. So it like it's, mixing entrepreneurship with innovation and like inviting us into those spaces like of yeah. companies that have the the money and the wherewithal to make those things possible. Yeah. So that's the challenge that I would it is more and, so and, 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 and I think monetization is a really difficult challenge. And I'd love to tell you there's like a perfect answer for it. But that's what startups are is trying to figure it out. It's that uncertainty around what a startup is. I think I tell you off the bat, just like I, I, I wish I thought like you did I, that you do now at, at, at your age. Like, uh, already the questions they hear are just amazing. That, that's a great point. Yes, sir. So, like, what about a business as a service that supports itself, like Uber? Do you see that, like, eventually expiring? I mean, they can, like, continue the business model and just, like, tweak it here and there over the next several decades and, like, still provide. Yeah, I mean, here's, here's, here's the God's honest truth. In, in my view, in my experience, and I think there's a fair amount of data research behind it. Is um, Uber's living in the same dynamic, friction world that you and I are living in. They got threats on all kinds of levels, legal, right? Obviously, just went through a big CEO issue and some culture issues. And God bless the shareholders of the board protecting Uber from its own management and trying to create value. Um, Uber's also got issues around competitors coming in and the change in transportation as a market. Like, I, obviously, the industry of transportation is going through massive change. So as a service that supports itself like that, um, I, 
you can keep winning and keep surviving because it's going to come down to supporting yourself. Now, the real question is, is who losing money every, every, every quarter? They're really not supporting themselves. They're riding on, they're like the second greatest funded venture capital firm ever. And the first is down, just surpassed them is down in South Florida. Uh, Magic. They have a good business model. They have a hell of a business model. No, I think food is where they're heading next. Delivery of food. Um, uh, Scott uh, Galloway, Professor Galloway from NYU Stern, talks a lot about package delivery. That the really tough part of Amazon or any of the delivery services is what's called the last mile. How do you, getting to the last mile is the hardest part, right? Because we're all scattered. Like we can get it to Atlanta really fast. How do we get it to Cummings, Georgia? That's a different story, right? Those last few miles. If you can start to leverage Uber drivers and see them, this sounds so inhumane, but you see them as a delivery system, whether it be people, food, packages, medicine, right? They're always on, easily trackable, capacity goes up and down, we need them, and we pay it. And that last mile, by the way, is a hell of a lot cheaper than a UPS truck. So, kind of interesting. I, I, I think that model is interesting when they get beyond drivers. I mean, just, just the thought of us catching a ride and me avoiding you know, interaction with the police officer. <laughs> I still have a hard time imagining how it's actually going to work, but think of the disruption from self-driving well, you, you, self cars. Uh, yeah, I, I, we'll talk a little bit about that too. Um, Tesla already is inviting Uber into their cars, where yeah. you, the car will take itself. What? To the, the Ask, is it Ford that's uh, one of the, the big-time investors in Lyft? Um, I believe so. Sure. So there, There's a lot of disruption in that industry. Transportation is really interesting. GM. Uh, General Motors um, recruits heavily here at FSU, and I know the recruit really well. I've watched it for years and listened to what, and I've been to GM's headquarters for uh, an NBA case competition thing, and I was fascinated with like I went in going to the Suns, like I could get it. I was like I, I'm not, you know, I don't like. It. And what when you got into their tech side, it was pretty impressive. It, they read all these players recognize the change. Not everyone's going to win, right? And I think there's a lot of convergence in those things. I think people die, I think things get merged. I think, um, for instance, probably one of the hottest tech companies when I was coming out of school, or when I was kind of shifting into tech, was a company called Lotus. And Lotus, uh, Lotus Technologies did the precursor to the spreadsheet Excel, and they eventually lost to Microsoft. Microsoft really made its bones on, on Excel before all the Office stuff. And Lotus then got bought by IBM, which Makes sense because they suck now. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, these are the disruptors. This is what's going on. These companies, some of these companies went to valuations faster than any companies ever in the history of the world. It's amazing. Um, WeWork is the one that, like, if you actually caught the front page of the Wall Street Journal, and I don't care if you're science, medicine, whatever, please occasionally skim the Wall Street Journal. It's just worth it. Uh, WeWork is, is a company that people are going, like, how the hell are they worth so much money? Like they literally are worth. Do you even know what we work is? Um, so it's like a, it's a, it's basically a co-work space. So they basically go and rent a floor in a building. They started, I think, in Brooklyn, maybe New York, and take bad buildings, rent the whole floor out, make it super cool in there. Cool design, really. Put a coffee bar, put a real bar, rent out space for startups. Is that the name of I don't know. Is he um, John Mendy? The shark guy? No, he may be invested in it, but he's not the. the I don't know. Is he still in the Yeah, so WeWork is the one where, uh, right now, when you leave here, just quick scan Wall Street Journal, and it'll say it's Pixie Dust. Because they're worth so much, so they rip one floor, and then their evaluation is that one floor is worth more than the whole building. Like, this sort of the business model is a lot of whack in terms of how we value it. but. I just think those things just change over time, and we get really hyped up about things. Investors get really hyped up about things, and then they lose a lot of money. Like I would argue to some people who might get angry about it. I think VC money and investment right now into VR would scare the hell out of me. Like I just think it's really hard to monetize it. I think we're still in generation one. Like if I'm putting my money and time and effort into it, um, I would be nervous because I don't. I'd lean towards AR versus VR, and we'll get to that in a second. Right? I've got to point out something, sure. given how old I am. When I was growing up, all the, the most wealthy companies, it was all based on their physical assets. Yeah. You know, 
General Motors and plants, Dow Chemical, the chemical plant, oil companies, and refineries, and drilling rig. And you look at those companies down, they basically have no physical assets. It's all, it's almost all. Well, it's intellectual it, property. I think it's intellectual property. I think it's capitalization. So who's yeah. my finance folks? We had a couple of econ finance. It's just not based on physical assets. Yeah, it's. That's what they do. They're, they're under, they don't leverage their capital very well. So if you just, the simplest way to explain Uber and Airbnb is we're just taking excess capital, excess asset, and leveraging it because we're not using it. It's what is cloud computing, essentially. Cloud computing, if you don't understand, is really just computing on someone else's servers, and we're just connected in the most simplest forms via the internet or some kind of pipeline. But all we're really doing is before we had 25 servers or whatever you had in a data center, and we were only using the computing power and the storage of that at certain times, so we weren't properly leveraging the asset, right? So to some degree, we built great companies and great wealth on just these capital assets. And then someone else figured out through technology, connectivity, some of the financial technologies and the innovation around that stuff, that we figured out that, hey, you know what's better? I don't want to own that asset. You know what I can do is I can split that asset up a whole bunch of ways and leverage it across a bunch of people. I think isn't it that Amazon change? that gets like eighty percent of revenue from cloud computing. Uh, it's not eighty, but it's been it's, it's, um, it's so most it's eight, of the revenue. Yeah, or a lot. Of it's, uh, they got just fun. Yeah, AWS is the number one cloud computing, which is fascinating that they started with books, right? Got to all this stuff, and now they basically run. I believe the FBI is on Amazon's. Uh, cloud computing stuff. So from a bookstore to being like so good at cloud computing, they actually started selling their excess capacity of the technology. That's why I like about Amazon, right? Like Amazon's changed their business model and continues to grow on one and build whole new businesses. It's fascinating. Are you familiar with Virgin Mobile? Yeah. Yeah. Right, so how do you say like they continue to like do well? I don't know if they're doing well, but like I know they started out with phones and like just calling services, yeah. but now they're trying to get space. Like how does that happen? Like, <laughs> it's a great question. I, I'm not. I know of them, but don't. It's not just one of those companies I study, so I okay. can't really tell you. Um, like I always laugh that um, Elon Musk is like a superhero. Like how did that guy end up in in batteries, space, and cars? Like okay. who the hell is gonna work for him? That's crazy. It's like that. um, I don't know, man. Like I, but I do think this. It speaks a lot to adaptability and disruption. I think um, the company I own, the one that was most successful that we sold off to uh, a company that's on the NASDAQ, um, we thought of ourselves as a, as a, to be honest, a gift and stationary designer. Leading edge, we sold to businesses. Our biggest client was Neiman Marcus, uh, Barnes and Noble, and I only did business not in their stores. I wanted to be on their websites because I felt like I didn't want my inventory sitting there. It was costing me too much. So the way we got in with these retailers is you go to the purchasing people and they go, they're trying to figure out how much they're going to stock and buy. I'm like, no, 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 you're not buying anything. Like, just let me be on your website. I'll take care of everything on the back end. I used to call it like the Amazon model for, for high-end gift stationary stuff. And then I had really good artists who were cutting edge deciding what was trendy. And then we were putting it on there, right? But what I really missed is, A, I sold too late. So I'm not every time argument around the timing of selling every startup. Um, B, I didn't recognize and monetize all our value. You know what we were really good at? Picking freaking trends. I made my mortgage payment on whether my wife and her four designers thought Paisley was, was going to be in next year, or Stripes, or, and they were really good. And they had a methodology around it. Sort of like Amazon. They had to build a cloud infrastructure. They had to learn how to do delivery. And one day, someone inside the organization was smart to go, you know what we're really good at? I think it was cloud computing. I know we can sell that. <laughs> you know, we had skills in our company that we didn't realize how to build new business models around. We could have figured it out. Building a business model is not rocket science. It's practice, right? There's a methodology around it. I just didn't think that way. I mean, shame on me, right? Um, but the world was different then, too. And if there was no entrepreneurship classes. It wasn't that I knew of, right? Yes? When a company is adapting their business model to like increase the value, sure. how do you recommend that they minimize the instability in that process? Oh gosh, um, to me, um, it's where the lean startup would make a lot of sense to you, is you want, anytime you're trying to create a new product, I think you want to do the, the, the trendy way to say it is minimally viable product, MVP. Um, 
well, simplify and not be so catchy with the phrase. Ship something imperfect, simple, test it. Don't spend a lot of money on it and see if it, catch, if it takes off, right? So um, the instability around that, I think, is almost like A-B testing, if you know what I mean by A-B testing. Like, I want to put that product out, and maybe even the other version we were talking about, which one works? Okay, we're going to go down that way. And by which one works, I mean which one sells something? Who buys it? Um, I'm, like one of those like old person statements that I repeat over and over again. Like you don't really have a startup until you actually you're not an entrepreneur until you sold something, and not to your mom. Yeah, like it's got to be a stranger who's willing to pay you for whatever product you've got. And in my mind, you're in theory until you actually do that. Okay. And you can still fail at that, but then the question is, how do I minimize? But at least if I know someone bought it, and hopefully more than one, and the next person, and the next person, and I get smarter how to get to them, then I know I'm creating real value, and then I get back to the monetization question, right? If there's our, you know, I want to create value, and then I want to capture value for the organization. Right? What is it called again? The minimum. Minim uh, MVP, minimally viable product. Um, Seriously, you, you don't have to read the whole book. That's probably not what you want me to say, but go look up the Lean Startup, and you can probably get a, it's an old reference, a Cliff Notes type of you know, shortcut to at least get some understanding of what I'm talking about. And ultimately, it's kind of like what Zuckerberg says at Facebook. He's like, done is better than perfect. In other words, you can spend all day perfecting. Let's get something out in the market and see if it works. And if it does, then I'm going to invest more time and money on that. If it doesn't, then I need to go back and rethink why it doesn't work, right? And shift that model or shift the, the aesthetics, any number of things to test. All right, so I would argue that these are the ones that I think about as being uh, leading edge, so, right? I, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll ask you, being build the thing is, is tricky, especially coming as the, as the second act. But I'm, I'm honored. Oh, I'm not you on time, too. Sorry. Right. Uh, so, yeah, like, if I could just get at least 30 minutes. Yeah, what time? Not, not the last 30, because I want to see the force. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Jesus. Um, <laughs> right. Right. Let's slide it really quick. All right, so I would argue this, uh, the big ones here are Internet of Things, and you're going to go, every one of these, you're going to go, are you all about it? Internet of Things tells me that we're getting beyond just connecting a bunch of stuff and leveraging what's called the edge. So the edge is, okay, so my freaking kitchen, my refrigerator is now connected to the Internet. Well, if I'm not leveraging the data that comes out of the, the refrigerator, then all I've done is connect it to the Internet, right? So the push now, the next emerging trends where we can monetize and create real value is on the edge of IoT, where we're connecting things and then using that edge computing piece to actually drive real decisions, i.e. less <coughs> friction, right? And if I can create less friction, then more value. Caesar, thank you so much. No, no, I'll, I, 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 I'll, ask, I'll ask, are you all ready to say, we thought we were going to be in some hours. So you guys want to stay for I think, I think the slide is actually an hour and a half. It's an hour and a half. So, yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, um, so, and also, we're going to put this on so you guys can get access to data analytics again, another boring subject where you go, oh my gosh, I've heard about data and big data forever. I would suggest to you that data is still going to explode year over year, which is the cost of sensors and edge kind of internet of things is driving more data analytics. And I would argue that we're going to get significantly better. Right now, we're great at producing data. We're decent at storing data. We're horrible at using data, right? So the money is really going to be into using and the analytics around it, right? Edge computing, I'm kind of hit with the, these are, these first kind of four are really connected. They're really connected around this idea of a connected world, right? So edge computing, I've kind of explained. Um, that sounds crazy, but if you think about organizations, they tend to be very inside out. Like, we're going to hold all this, we're going to come up with a business model, we're going to store it in our servers, we're going to put it in our cloud. And then they've got all these people out there with, like, mobile phones, and they're collecting all this data on the edge with computing power, and they're not leveraging it, right? So, John, the definition of edge computing is essentially... It's the computing on the edge. It's the device outside. So, um, it's for us, it's going to be, how do we leverage your mobile phones if we're at FSU to figure out, like, do you attend? You know, where's the best engagement level? We don't leverage that at all, but you've got the computing power sitting right there that got people to the moon in the 60s, right? I mean, we're using it for Snapchat. Yeah. <laughs> and we got a lot of excess capacity there. Does that make sense? Um, all right, so something we talked about forever, 
but it's all wrapped together as the connectivity. It's the five. It's five G. I mean, at the end of the day, this is where we sit today, and really to gain the connectivity we want and to really leverage the edge in data analytics, we got to head towards that, and that's that's what's coming. These things don't happen overnight, but these are like the. I'm kind of giving you more of the businessy tech side. If that makes sense. Why is it that? 4G, like it says, it says that's supposed to be 100 megabytes. We never guess, right? Completely false. Yeah, I know. And um, if we dove into that a little bit, it's also geographical, right? It's density. Um, the LTE enabled thing is kind of like the stepping stone between 4G to get us to 5G. We've got a long way to go with that. Um, the reality is, I would suggest, and oftentimes when we talk mobile technology, we're held back by two big things connectivity, the you know, 4G versus 5G, and battery power. I mean, battery power just kills me. I mean, we all suffer through that, right? Uh, it sounds like friction, by the way. It sounds like a business opportunity. Um, so blockchain is where we're going to go with that. Um, and I'll just go super quick, because you guys probably know a little bit about it. But to me, it's not about Bitcoin. And honestly, I don't think it's, I think we missed the point that I think financial markets, because of Bitcoin, are adopting the quickest. But blockchain is more important than that. Uh, blockchain is really about, essentially, it's like a, a virtual ledger so that we can verify transactions actually happen across any platform. So, i.e., if I'm doing business with someone in China or India or wherever, um, that verification piece, being able to do that seamlessly in a transaction super quick without middle, you know, middle transactors that have to like basically hold money and release money and all those things, and there's billions in that market, that's what blockchain is really about. It's going to be applied beyond financial and more into just non-financial transactions if, you, if you're with me. And I know I'm flying through. So AI, um, some of you might have heard this when I first started. Like artificial intelligence, again, I keep telling you things, you're like, I know all about that. That's some emerging technologies. They've been around forever. Um, the difference is, I think, AI, we've gotten pretty good on the consumer side. I mean, hell, 20% of us, I think, more than that already, uh, use voice in our home with the speaker systems like Alexa and those kind of things. But you know who hasn't used them yet? Businesses internally. You know what's bigger the B2B market is than the B2C? Oh, the B2B market dwarfs B2C market, right? The transaction between companies globally is way bigger than us as consumers, right? And when we start embedding that stuff in, which we are, artificial intelligence into those platforms, imagine if you're a really, really good sales rep and you can not like sales reps or whatever, but if someone that's moved millions of dollars in transactions selling software, if I put AI in their CRM system, their customer relationship management system, and I walk up and see you, and the last time we're, we're trying to get a $20 million deal done, and I've got $20 million deals all over the world, and I come to you, and as I'm coming in, that CRM system pops up on my phone and goes, hey, you know, last time you guys talked about the Dodgers game, and you talked about the World Series, and oh, by the way, here's what his complaint was about your proposal. If all that stuff happens in real time, it allows me to make better decisions and build that relationship to get that stuff done. AI is going into that. Like what I want from AI is I want it to help drive my next decision. I don't want it to decide it for me. I want it to help drive the next decision. You can almost put it in like, uh, I, always, I always use like Yelp or Zomato or whatever. If I land in Brooklyn at that exact second and I want Thai food, and I need it quick. I want that app to basically help drive me to the next best decision. I'm gonna go to that Thai restaurant because it's got four stars and it's got two dollar signs and I can read really quickly what the menu is as opposed to this other Thai restaurant. I just made a better decision. We took that to restaurants now, drive that into big dollar decisions in a business. Woo, that's bad. That's where the AI value is really gonna head. All right, I think it's the last piece and I'm gonna be done with this. Um, AR versus VR. Um, super simple definition for those who don't know. VR is, think of it as immersing. You're going into a whole other world, all right? And AR is really just an overlay to the existing world. So think like Pokemon Go on your phone, right? Both super hot, both lots of VC money. Both are really going to end up fighting for a platform to kind of own content, I think. I would argue that AR has got a way big, bigger leg up because we're not wearing bulky things, we're not tethered to those pieces. And honestly, go back to the B2B ramifications, not the B2C, business to consumer, let's go to the B2B. There's incredibly interesting pieces we can do here with AR. 
think surgeons in the middle of surgery with glasses that can lay over you know, a roadmap over a live body while having surgery. I think fire, uh, a fire person walking into a smoky building, they had to memorize you know, how to get through, or they could have quickly, along with a heat seeker that tells you where there is someone behind that door, we gotta get them, right? Those are just two examples. So my argument is I think in the near term, AR is gonna be way, way more impactful. But yours come. I mean, I just, that's my thought. Okay, moving on in the spin there. Last parting thing is all this stuff's really good. I just kind of invest, tell you to invest in you all the time. Pick these skills up. Try to stay current on technology. Watch the trends and then try to apply them in your businesses, right? In startups, either social entrepreneurship or, or, or for profit. Either one. They're pretty valuable and I'm super psyched you guys are here on Friday doing it. Let me jabber on for too long. <laughs> What I'll try to do is I'll try to make mine seem so, so sorry. You need like a call. <laughs> I, 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 um, I am honored to be in the same place. You know, it's the first time we've done it together. And I didn't realize yeah, we haven't done it together. Yeah, we haven't. I didn't realize I'm the speaker here. So I'm, so I'm glad to be on the, to consider on the same team. But a tough act to follow for sure. All right. So let me get mine going. What I'll do is I'll keep, I'll keep mine thin so that we have a little bit of time to maybe get some more of the, more of the questions that I think you want to keep asking. John is at the School of Entrepreneurship. I'm at the School of Medicine. I am, uh, like I tell one other time, I'm more on the innovation side of the innovation entrepreneurship spectrum. I see entrepreneurship as a hammer, in other words, but, uh, but it, when you have an innovation, you have the opportunity to use that hammer to create value. And my interest in my career, my path has been about innovation. But you need entrepreneurship to bring it to the world. So both are valuable. That's what I think. Okay, so don't be so shy and tell them, tell them why you pulled this up, how many different degrees you have. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is why I didn't want to do it, because I'm really uh, a salesy guy. Come on, <laughs> He's the really smart guy. I, I think it's a friendly That's why we team. need teams, right? Yeah, you <laughs> need... gotta have teams. <laughs> so I'll, I'll, so my, my own background is, uh, is, is medicine and computer science, and I've uh, put those together into uh, work, into bioengineering. And so I, I literally, day to day, I think about how to reprogram cells. The reason I want to come up here, I think John's talk is amazing. It was a good talk. And I, actually, I was in Silicon Valley for 10 years. I've seen good talks. This was a good talk. And so I'm, I'm proud of you with you, John. Oh, yeah. And like I said, I get a flavor of what Southern entrepreneurship looks like. Yeah. So I'm excited about it. We got a good year to talk about yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, slurring my voice. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, I'm on myself. I'm from Jersey originally, Columbia before then, for anybody who's here as Latino. But uh, as in my family, I was born in Jersey, but my uh, but I came to Florida as a 15-year-old to Miami. So so Florida is in my and I came to FSU. So I believe part of England. Uh, but I spent a decade in the West Coast. I love California. I love San Francisco. It's in my DNA now. And so I, I say that I'm bi-coastal. Mm -hmm. So it, it literally, if you, if you get to know me, you'll see that both those worlds, the East Coast, West Coast world, is what is how I operate. Sorry, that's the quick on me. You gotta leave out your medical degree and your surgical residency. Uh, yes. Mm. <laughs> Five pounds has been interesting, which we definitely can talk about. But this, let's get to this. The reason, the reason I, I want to make sure to talk is because John is dead on. The opportunities that we have, the world that we've created, is the best that we've ever created as a, you know, as a, as a species. Right? We are better than we've ever been. All that garbage we're hearing from Washington, ignore it. That's that's. That is that is that is that is ideas that are going to die off very soon, right? We are better than we've ever been, and we're just about to get better. And the technology I'm about to show you is points you know, is pointing to this better state. Now, is it dangerous? Absolutely. Uh, it's part of the deal, right? So available emerging technology for next generation entrepreneurs. I think maybe Wendy, we could recall this. Let's call this like better hammers or new hammers. <laughs> I'm in full agreement with John. These are hammers. I'm about to show you some of the most powerful hammers that we've come up with. But you have to know about it because it's going to affect just about all the businesses that you list out today. Right? So we live in a world today that we can imagine, we can design, and we create things. Uh, those of you who come from a uh, school of engineering, you know that. That's what you do day to day. Right? You sit there, you think of some idea, you go in, you go on CAD, you try to make that idea electronically, then you go off and then try to bring it in the real world. This is routine now for us. Think about this. You think that this is routine. For us, uh, as a, yeah, we can say as a species, right, a biologist. 
as a, you know, as a, as a, as a as an organism. Right? Most technology, when you think of technology, we celebrate the the video talk. We think of essentially as hardware and software. What is hardware? It's technology that basically the materials cost money, right? This guy was just falling in cracks. So it's hard. Uh, my wife keeps saying, when are you going to buy your phone? Oh, I'll get it tomorrow. I'll get it tomorrow. Cash here. Um, so anyway, so this guy's hard. Right? In there, it, the technology's in here. Some of it is actually very similar to some of the first technologies that we came up with as, as again, as a, as a species, right? And uh, but we, we put it a compact and we're all together. And then we, we developed software, which is just a way to, to make this hardware efficiently reorganized. That's what's going on in here, right? We, we, we have all this all this technology has changed switches in here so they can behave differently. Right? That's software. You have hardware and software. When we say technology, you're usually implying those two things. Well, we have used these, two, these technologies to improve health, to improve happiness, and to improve the prosperity of, of, of humans throughout the world. Right? As we have used it to kill and destroy life throughout the world. It's a, it's a hammer. And so I implore us, our generation, but on the older side of it, but our generation, that we use these tools, these gifts that we've, we've given to ourselves and whatever beliefs you have in you know, the universe and, 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 other, and other entities that you, you may believe in have given us these gifts. Let's use them to improve the health and happiness and prosperity of all humans. Right? Technology that I think is going to get us there is already moving us in that direction comes from the rise of a new discipline that's now in our hands. And I, the, the discipline is simple name, it's biological engineering. We're living, we're literally living the as well as describe the importance of those features for function. During this video, we will look at different representations of the DNA molecule to better view certain details, but all views represent the same structure. Inside the cell, you will most commonly find double-stranded DNA, in which two strands intertwine to form a double helix. The most common form of the DNA. So this is just a quick reminder of DNA. For those of you who have been, haven't seen biology since high school, right? it's essentially a big molecule that stores information. That, in that way, it has a lot of similarity with the Amazon's cloud services. We'll see in a minute how that connects. Right, so you have then. The A, G, T's, and C's, adenine, white, thiamine, cytosine. We're not going to get into any details here about this, but this is the, the code, the code of life. And what's changed is that we can now synthesize this at scale. You literally can go online now and buy DNA. So, Twist, if you go online, Twist Biosciences, they're based in San Francisco, you literally can go in, put code in, and they send you back DNA. That's only one of about four or five countries in this area. So how do you utilize it? What do you, what do, you do with the DNA synthesis? That's the perfect question. That was my question. Okay. That's my question. <laughs> you guys are perfect. That's, the, that's, <laughs> that's, the, that's, that's what this, is, this, this discussion is about. So, all right, so what do we do with DNA? Right? So now you're living in a world where we can imagine, design, create, not only hardware, software, but this interesting entity that uh, the community that I work with might call it DNA. Right? Again, I keep imploring them to use it for improving our health, happiness, and prosperity. So, what exactly is wetland? One of the earliest use of that term comes from a book by a sci fi writer, a scientific science fiction writer, uh, that uh, put the term out there, Rudy Rucker. Uh, the term probably existed before then, but that's one of the earliest documented use of it. I have, a, I have a you know science complex of definition for it, but a good, strong, accessible definition is programmable systems made of biological materials. Okay? It is very much in kind for this unit here. But this one, if I put water on this one, what happens? It malfunctions. Right? Water is not happy with water. Wetware is the exact opposite. What happens when you put water on, say, a dried apple or a seed, let's say a seed, that's the, the, the perfect one. Right? It turns on and goes to work. It's the exact opposite of this. What we're living through right now is that we now understand the connection between that seed and this unit. It 
turns out to be very intimate. Right? We're about to see what happens when you understand that connection. So what happens now, because we have this, this, this availability of cheap DNA that we can synthesize, and we have this capacity to manipulate it and use it, a whole new area, a whole new world of opportunities now are we have, a, we have an opportunity to, to address a whole new set of problems at multiple scales. So, with DNA, we can actually use the DNA itself to engineer. So this is what you're seeing here is an actual nanoscale, meaning that the size here is one billionth of a meter small. A nanoscale robot that actually opens up on command. There's, there's stories about what that command is, why it's open and so forth. You have to get into those details. But the strands that you're seeing here in this model is actual DNA. This is called DNA origami. RNA, another molecule related to nucleic acids. Again, no need for the details. Just know that people right now are able to reprogram it to do logic. Literal logic like you would do on a computer. And, or, not. Sitting in, in those molecules. Proteins, for quite a while now, for decades, we've been able to read or read or engineer proteins, what's called protein engineering. And so this, for example, is a design that comes from college students imagining a design of protein. Everything you see here is protein. And if you're wondering what protein is, just look at yourself. Your skin is protein, your nails are protein. Right? You don't have to know the, the details of, of what it is, but we can design very complex structures with that. Viruses have been now engineered for decades and we're just getting better. One of my colleagues in the West Coast, I was at a company called Autodesk before coming here, he was able to build a, a de novo virus with $1,000. What that does de novo mean? Meaning that the, 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 the virus was, was taken, it was a natural virus that was taken, it was reshuffled, and such as recoded, and then they synthesized it, put it in a cell, and the cell produced it. Modified virus and the cost to make the DNA was a thousand bucks. And that cost has come down since then. This is a three year old project. And is this new virus like a vaccine for the other one? This or is it used to fight the, the new virus? Is what it's used for? In this case, it was just a demonstration of the cost to be able to do it. And uh, this virus was, was, was a particular virus that's against uh, bacteria. Yeah. yeah, so in this case, it was not, it had no real function. Well, it has the function of just being a virus. So we, uh, the idea is to then, because of that capacity that for a thousand bucks you can you know, create new viruses, mm -hmm. you can then envision, say, creating an antibiotic yeah. with a new virus. Based. It's just one example among many other things that we can do. And that cost now is probably down to about five hundred bucks. Um, engineering of bacteria has also been going on for decades and is now getting an exponential in our capacity to do it. Here you're looking at a, a bacteria that was literally engineered to communicate back the state that it was in. I don't know if you notice there's like a little red period there. And it wasn't green. Okay, a lot of details here that you don't have to get into, but just know that that was engineered in the lab to basically report back. We're engineering tissues. This is an example of synthetic synthetic liver coming out of San Diego, one of the development in San Diego. And this is a project out of Europe, I think specifically Switzerland, and you're refreshing the details, where they actually can grab the cells from our body, stem cells, embedded on a scaffold that was 3D printed based on the patient's own anatomy. And then the cells grew on that scaffold and then they re implanted the tree. Correct. What did they 3D print it out of? Like the structure? Uh, it, it's, uh, it's, it's about, it's a, it's a bioavailable, uh, bioavailable material, so it's essentially you just take it raw and you take it out. I don't know specifically which okay. material. It's not, it's not like, not like classic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's going to look great on the next year. Okay, so your question. Key question, what do you do with all this low-cost DNA? Well, a lot. You can see that big, that big survey. Let's look at three specific cases of emerging businesses related to the availability of cheap DNA. So Microsoft has decided that we could store 
DNA. We've known this for a while. We can store data with DNA. And what they're seeing it as a business opportunity, basically like a, essentially like a cloud service, a storage, long-term storage service. So here's the story related to that. We, we've documented this case. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and start. Uh, oh, perfect. We're working on a problem of storing large volumes of digital data. The issue we're dealing with is that we're producing a lot of data and current storage technologies cannot keep up with it. We are using DNA as a storage medium for digital data. We are using synthetic DNA for data storage. So that means that we store in zeros and ones in two DNA molecules. And the zeros and ones can be images, video, anything, any data you want. And the reason we're doing that is because DNA is very dense. You can put a lot of data in a small volume. To give you an idea, uh, the whole accessible internet is estimated to be about 700 exabytes. And that would fit in the size of a shoebox. The other reason is DNA is very durable. In the right conditions, DNA can last for thousands of years compared to other storage technologies that last in the order of decades. And finally, DNA does not get obsolete. DNA will always be relevant. We always gonna have reasons to need DNA. DNA is made up of various sequences of four types of molecules, A, C, G, and T. The first step in the process is to return the data we want to store into sequences of those four molecules, along with the markers that identify where data belongs in the original sequence. These sequences are then synthesized into actual DNA. When we receive the DNA, many files may come together in a single pool. We make a number of checks and then use a process called polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, to select only the sequences of the files we want to read. The PCR process will multiply only the sequences of those files. The last step is to read those sequences and turn them back into data. So last year, we stored hundreds of kilobytes of data in DNA and we fully recovered that. This year, we're working with hundreds of megabytes of data, which means a thousand times more DNA. In building the world record, we've worked with uh, Twist Bioscience to synthesize uh, 200 megabytes of data, which is well beyond anything that's been synthesized to date. Along with the collaboration with the University of Washington, we've demonstrated that we're able to recover data built out of 1.5 billion nucleotides. The growth that we're experiencing in our global data centers is truly astounding. It's a challenge not only in creating new technologies to deal with it, but in actually inventing the new science to form a foundation for the future. DNA storage gives us that new foundation, and this is exactly the kind of problem that Microsoft Research was built to solve. This is already such an active business opportunity. When you go to Twist Bioscience's website, that's one of the services they offer. Right. Okay. Right. Another, what do you do with this DNA? Well, it looks like now we can make jackets made out of spider seed. 2.8 billion years of evolution. Our team has extensively studied the diverse genetic designs found in nature. We've developed advanced methods to create new, tailor-made protein materials designed at the molecular level. For the first time in history, we are harnessing the power of evolution in order to create high-performance, sustainable, and exciting protein materials. This has endless applications and unlimited potential.
This is the dawn of a new era. This creative endeavor could transform not only manufacturing, but our entire society. We have vision, drive, and determination. The revolution starts now. That jacket you saw there used the original silk came from a spider called the golden warp spider. So that gold color you see that is actually embedded in the material itself. It's a property of the material. And you can tweak that. You can probably tweak the colors, you can tweak elasticity, and other properties from engineering the, uh, the DNA that makes that make those proteins. Wait, is that available already? Yeah. It's, uh, it's being shown around the world. Uh, uh, North Face shows it at the at conferences. And I don't know where it is right now. It was, it was in the U.S. not too long ago. What's the advantage of having a spider silk? Huh? What's the advantage of having spider silk? Uh... Oh, spider silk is one of the it's one of the most amazing materials on the planet. It's uh, stronger than steel, lighter than aluminum. You know, it's just as well as It's not plastic. Are you the farm? I only guess. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. You can just grow it. You know, you literally, you literally, you're literally, um, the the process they use to grow that produce is what we use for doing beer. You can literally ferment. There's more of the story, but that's at the heart of it. All right, last one. So how about cells that secrete? Going back to again to your strong question, cells that secrete of cancer therapy. This is out of uh, University of California, San Diego. This was in the last video, and that puts us right at time. This was this one doesn't have the fancy marketing aspect to it. This is raw. Science here. Of course, there's a new video that I should bring in from Novartis that Novartis that tells the same story. So I'll have that as well. Just look at it here. So, just what you're looking at here is something that is a uh, hundred microns, so one millionth of a meter, so very small. These are actual cells that you're seeing in there. And what up there, what it is, is it's a flow of liquid, fluid that's going in, and cells that are coming in and leaving. Okay, so we're about to see what that looks like. These cells have been literally programmed to synchronize with each other, they're communicating with each other, and then when they reach a certain concentration, they burst, and then release the cancer therapy. Okay? So let's watch it. So they're just like like the globulate cells, like like they just secrete like fluids based on like the water and like how do they specialize to that's crazy. Yeah, that's a lot crazy. of questions. <laughs> <laughs> let me let me um yeah, okay. I have the video, I, I know why that failed. And uh, but let me let me just stop for a second. So anyway, if I if I show the video which I can, but I don't want to hold anybody up, just one thirty. What you would see is that the cells you see them growing. And multiplying, and then suddenly in synchrony, they all turn green. That green is the green fluorescent, pro uh, green fluorescent protein that it releases to signal back that I'm about to burst. And then they burst, and then they release the cancer. It's the cancer therapy, not the cancer. Therapy. And, uh, and they just keep doing it. They just cycle through and do that. I'll, I'll show up the video, but I don't want to hold it. Anybody that needs to leave, go ahead and just come through. Please leave. If anybody wants to see the video, give me a minute and I'll bring it up. And then I'll answer. Well, you know, uh, John, are you cool staying to answer your question? Yeah, I, I, I got a little bit of time. Perfect. So, um, so Everybody be sure you sign in before you go if you haven't already signed in.
show to you. I can't give it to you. Okay. Sorry about that. So these are cells. And that's the first. I don't do a couple of flight crusades with you. They just burst. Now they're growing again. The bacteria are growing, growing, growing. They need the right concentration to communicate to each other. And they synchronize their burst. And they're going to do it again. And this was this was all human engineering. The connections to FSU here is that the lab that this was developed in, the the um, the professor at the exam lab did part of his training here at the natural system that already exists that bacteria use to, to control their populations. Um, how does it, so like say cancer is like, like it's, there's no sign of it in the body, how does, how does the cell remove itself from this situation? Like, how does it stop exploding? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so it's, right, so in this case, this is a prototype. I said this is what you're seeing here is research, you know, like literal research in, uh, in that it was just published last year. And so this, this would not be something that would actually end up in the clinic. It was just a demonstration that you could build these types of circuits. And for the engineers, for example, what you're seeing here is a synchronized oscillator. So these, these, the, 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 the programming of the cell is going through a cycle. And then the units, these other cells, are then communicating to, to each other to synchronize that cycle. And so that therefore you can essentially begin to control the performance of the cells. So this is just more of an engineering uh, demonstration that it can be done versus something you apply in the clinic. There is a there is a very recent, just August 30th, FDA approved the first ever genetically engineered uh, immunotherapy for a type of cancer, a type of cancer called leukemia, uh, called um, Acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And so that one, what they do is they take the that's something that I, that I, for the next time around, I'll have that video to the presentation. They take the cells from the patient, they grow them in the lab, they modify them genetically, they actually add a protein to it. They add a gene that produces a protein, in this case, a receptor uh, that, that it needs to know what the, you know, what, the, what the cancer is. They then take those cells and put it back into the patient, and then those cells go and attack the cancer. This was just approved this, this past month, and uh, this is an area that's going to blow up. That can really help to prevent like remission and stuff. That's exactly what it's been approved for. Yeah. That's exactly what it's approved for. It's approved for patients that the, 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 the existing therapy does not work in children, actually up to the age of 25. So the, as you can imagine, the, the, the medical market, and I agree with you, the medical market is ripe for disruption. One, two, it is one of the largest um, markets in the United States. I'm going to speak of the world. It's 16% uh, of GDP now. I think what's six trillion? Yeah. Six trillion dollars per year that is, uh, are involved uh, healthcare costs. So these opportunities are, are, are really just beyond imagination. Here. It's it, massive. It's really cool to see the um, economy of it. Like you know how the economy self-regulates itself. But like with all that money, and like you said, when prices are rising and there's no innovation, that's where the change comes. Yeah. And so like. That's beautiful, like, to see that. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's interesting. It drives it. <clears throat> so I'm always pretty, though. It's kind of going to be okay, again, okay. So <clears throat> Alphabet, they um, they set a very ambitious goal to cure aging, um, which I, I translate as into immortality. But you, you presented uh, with, a, with a, I think it was a bag, not a bacteria, but one of the, in the videos that reports back what it finds. So how I say it is, if, if their goal is to cure aging, and it can insert this this uh, matter, biological matter, and it can report back the malfunctions that happens in the human body that causes us to age, do you see that as plausible to cure aging? Yeah, I, I don't use that language. I think it's a arrogant language. It's Silicon Valley language. <laughs> okay. uh, uh, aging is not a disease. Aging is a process. Uh, we, we are built to age. And I should say, I, I call it, it's almost like an American pathology that we like to think, think of aging as like a, like a, like a, it's a disease. It's not. It's, we're, we're built you know, to age. With that, I, I agree with you. Yeah. With that said, no, I, I hear you. Like I said, I, I, I hear the stuff coming out. A lot of the folks that are involved with this are, are, are like are electrical engineers. <laughs> they're, not, they're not biologists, but it doesn't matter. The point is that it is programmed. And, uh, and yes, can we reprogram cells to live, uh, to live, um, to be immortal, the answer is we can't do it, but we have examples of it. And a perfect example is, is what's known as the HeLa cells. These are cells that came from a patient back in the 1960s. The patient died, and I forget, the, I believe it was a kidney cancer, but 
bottom line is that the patient died, but those cells are still living. And it turns out that those cells, the aging program got snipped out by that particular cancer. So these cells have been immortal now since the period when they were recovered to this very day. And they're still growing in labs all over the world. So it is a program, and that program can be changed. So can we reprogram ourselves, that's the language I use, to, uh, to have a new feature of immortality? The answer is yes. You can. You just don't know how to do it quite right. So uh, in tandem with that is ethics, right? Um, are big time they, ethics. Big time ethics, because uh, you know, naturally then access to these various technologies or programs become an issue. Are the ethics... Yeah. I, I, clearly, this is highly regulated. Do you feel that the, or do you believe, or do you know that the ethical aspects are keeping up with the technological advances? That's a great question. It's not my area of expertise, so I, I don't want to venture too into it, too far into it. I can tell you that the community that I've been working with is very keen in on the ethical aspects of this. I do it because that, to me, I love technology and I work on technology, but this technology I find fascinating because it affects everything else. Because not only ethics, right? It's religion. It's social. You know, that the path to hell is paved with good intentions. Right. Absolutely. So no. So I, I, I uh, the community that's that's doing this work is very aware of, of this problem, but I still do believe that the technology is ahead of the ethical discussion. T t typically, that's the way innovation works. Is, is if you think about regulations and, and law um, in particular, they're reactive. By, by almost its nature, I, I always think about seatbelts. Right? We had the ability of the seatbelts in cars for way longer than we required people to use them. It took issues and problems for for the system, regulation, legal system to kind of catch up to like, hey, what is right here and what should we do? And I think you can look throughout history and see that. And that's why I kind of leave with like, I have trust in us. The, the, may get it wrong at some point, but we eventually get ourselves back to the right place. But this stuff is like crazy. I've never seen Caesar prove it. Was, so I was <laughs> just to be honest with you. Oh, so I was just curious. It's the only way I could keep up with you. Okay. <laughs> keep looking like so. okay. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Well, initially, when you said DNA, you can store it in high, I, I was thinking that you can actually like put it to yourself and then use it. Um, an example I'm thinking of is like maybe somebody has a schizophrenic trait, um, and you know they're passing their genes on, and the child might have you know, like mothers and daughters twins might be able to you know counteract that if you like give the mother a certain type of DNA to you know replace what she has you know maybe have a so like repairing it then yeah the like, like repairing it but I know like DNA itself can't fix the problem so you have to do like I don't know the right term but you can definitely like there's a process where you can counteract maybe if put like a virus to attack whatever's there that has the schizophrenic trait and then implant the new DNA, maybe replicate something that's like normal or from another parent or from another relative, and then maybe the child might take that and understand and so is that is that, is that like possible? Is that a thing? Very possible. Yeah. Your intuition is dead on. This was saying that as a generation, this is what you've inherited. Yeah, the implications are amazing. They're, so this is they're as, as profound as they come. So yes, we were. We, we are in position to have designer babies. Uh, the, the technology is called CRISPR. CRISPR. So it's a genome editing technology. What is it called? CRISPR. C R I S P R. It's a, it's an acronym, and I forget I forget the, the CRISPR. So if you look up CRISPR Cas9, C A S N I, C A S N I. And you said it's possible to like just like. Maybe a whole generation of once you know. We, there, there's the 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 uh, there's a there's a worldwide ban, at least again going back to your, your ethic question, that we should not be modifying what are called a germ lines. These are cells that, that could become a human, right? That we should not be modifying them. There's already been a number of experiments on them, and, and again, that's a whole story in its own. Um, but it's we're we're putting that constraint. It's not that we can't do it. It looks like we can do it. We replace that constraint because of this problem. Because the moment you start doing that, we are now marking the, the program of life itself. And so, therefore, chances are, given how ignorant we are of what we're doing, chances are we probably create more problems than good. And so, we put that moratorium on that. But I bet you there are people on the planet right now that are not following the moratorium. Um, you know, like, you know Lorenzo's oil? Okay. Like, you know Lorenzo's oil? Have you seen 
the movie? I haven't, no. Um, it's like a really, really like good emotional movie, but basically like he has a disease where like it can't be fixed, and I forget, forget what the disease is, even though. Um, it's in a situation like, in a situation scenario like that, like maybe it would be ethical because people that have the disease only live to like 20, let alone maybe like with, with extensive treatment, if not, then they would die when they're like early, early on. The questions are tough, and yeah. you are the generation that are yeah. making those decisions. You guys will probably just make it. I, I, just, I like I how you said the program of life, though. I like to take care of your elders. I just yeah, there, there's people that, that are uncomfortable with that, but I, I feel I feel very confident from you know my own work and the work of the community, the, the community that I work in, that that's correct. That life, you know, what life, what life, what you know, what evolved is essentially programmable systems. And that, and it makes sense, right? Programmable systems allow you to re to re uh, reorganize a system without having to invent too many new things. And that's why we do programming. You grab the same machinery and just reorganize when you start when you turn things on and off, and you get more machines. So it's more efficient. 